Excellent. I, I think we are ready to go. So uh, welcome everyone. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're so grateful that you're able to join us today for what will be the fifth in a series of Nikata virtual town halls. These are sponsored by the Board of Directors and the Council. Uh, these events are meant to be an extension of the town hall gathering that happens at the annual conference. So our topic of discussion today, as you see, is ex Nakata's external partnerships. And before we get to that, I'd like for you to meet our panel. So I'm gonna start with myself. My name is Kerry Kincannon. I'm the director of the University Exploratory Studies Program at Oregon State University, which is in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. And I'm on directors. Uh, I'm gonna have my colleagues introduce themselves in the order you see on the slide. So we will start with Donafu. Hello, everyone. Happy to be with you. Denny Fuelston, Vice President of Strategy at Complete College America. Good morning, good afternoon, morning, wherever you might be, everyone. I'm Charlie Nutt with Nakata, and I'm very excited about this particular um, town hall, virtual town hall, because of the partnerships that are represented here and how important these are to the future of the association and the future of higher education. So thank you, Kerry, for organizing this. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Dandeneau, the Executive Director of the Reinvention Collaborative. We're hosted at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. Hello everyone, I'm Vanessa Harris. I am the Academic Advising and Consultant Speaker Service Advisory Chair. Good day, everyone. I'm Drew Koch. I'm the President Chief Operating Officer at the John and Gardner Institute for Excellence in Undergraduate Education. It's great to be with you today. Hi, everyone. I'm Jane Drake. I am formerly of Temple University, currently serving as the co-manager of the Excellence in Academic Advising program that's being run uh, in concert with the Gardner Institute. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. We're excited to join you in conversation and have you be a part of this town hall. So uh, what you're gonna see now is the agenda for today. Um, you will note, uh, once that agenda comes up on the screen from the first three items, that um, we have some explanatory material that, that myself and the panel members will present at the top. Uh, this is meant to be, though, a participatory event. Um, and so uh, if you look down at the bottom of the, the screen that's framing, uh, framing our content, you're going to notice a Q&A button. And uh, as we're presenting, and certainly when we get to the discussion section of the town hall uh, later, later in the hour, um, please feel free to submit questions via this channel for, for our panelists. I'll be moderating those questions and framing them for our discussion. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the website that accompanies this Nakata event. A uh, link to this site went out uh, with the invite, and you'll also see the URL at the bottom of the screen. Um, on that site, you You'll see it to a Google form. Uh, we're going to be keeping this form open until August 30th. Uh, so if you have additional questions or thoughts that you want to submit, event, please feel free to use that form. Uh, this event is being recorded, and we will share this with the broader membership. So those who can't join us today will also have the opportunity to hear the, hear the discussion and submit their thoughts via the Google form. Okay, so why are we gathering around this particular topic? So you'll see from the slide here the, the rationale for the event. Uh, Nakata is supremely invested in making sure that academic advising is at the forefront of the salient conversations around student success and higher education innovation. Uh, we wanted to gather to shine a light on how Nakata is partnering with external institutes, initiatives and collaboratives to advance academic advising and the cause of student success and enhance the efficacy of post-secondary education. We have three learning outcomes that we hope to achieve today. Uh, you will hear a recap of conversation at the town hall in St. Louis about our external partnership. You'll hear directly perspectives and updates on the topic from both Nakata leaders 
and representatives from three of our key partners. And then we'll give you the chance via the Q&A function to ask questions, provide comments, suggestions related to our organization's interaction with external partners. Now, if you've been with us at previous town halls, you know that we put an emphasis on Nakata's strategic goals. So I wanna bring those up for you again today. It's equally important to reiterate them today. And also, I just wanna draw your particular attention to goal number two, provide professional development opportunities that are responsive to the needs of advisors and advising administrators. And goal number three, promote the role of effective academic advising and student success to college and university decision makers. I think those two are particularly relevant to our conversation today. To that end, um, our external partnerships uh, were an important topic of conversation at our 2017 annual conference in St. Louis. Here are two themes that emerged from that conversation. Uh, participants very much recognized the value and importance of our external partnerships, especially in positioning academic advising as a vital component of 21st century post-secondary education. And our participants also expressed a strong desire for transparency and frequent sharing about our external partnerships and any initiatives or opportunities that arise from those partnerships. Uh, so hence why we're gathering today. We want to make sure that we give you an update and we uh, are transparent about what's happening. So to that end, I am going to uh, uh, turn it over to our executive director, Charlie Nutt. And uh, before we get to your questions, we're going to have our panelists share some insight. But we're going to start with Charlie. Thank you, Kiri, and thank you all for being with us today, all the participants as well as our panelists. Um, one of the, I think, important things that Nakata really is so supportive and the board directors has been um, so supportive of our external partnerships is that in today's higher education realm, I think we are at a point in which we have the greatest potential to really impact student learning, persistence, and completion in higher education for future excellence. Um, so much is going on across the world in regard to budgets, in regard to, to publicity and public relations, and everything that we read about in any higher education journal or publication. And I think that more than ever before, we truly have the potential to impact student learning and student success in ways that in the past we've not and these partnerships are essential to that. We know that on our campuses that excellence in student learning and student success is a complicated process. It's not something that one area has responsibility for. It's not an academic affairs issue, it's not a student affairs issue, it's not a res life issue. It, it's a complicated process that requires communication and collaboration and partnerships across the institution. Um, every institution that, that we all work with, all of our partners as well as Nakata, we continually talk about the need for that collaboration, for that communication, for that building those partnerships across the campus. And without those, you're not gonna be successful. And from that standpoint, I really believe strongly, as well as our board of directors believes, that we can't ask institutions to break down these walls between units if our educational associations aren't breaking down our walls and beginning to really communicate and work together. I think we're past the stage in which higher education associations need to see themselves as competitive with each other and instead see us all as partners toward the common goal of improving student learning, improving student success, improving student completion in higher ed. And based upon that, I think these partnerships are essential. And so while Nakata is partnering with a number of, of associations across the world um, today, we really wanted to focus on three particular ones that I think are really impacting institutions of all types everywhere. And so the first one we want to talk about is, is our, our partnership with Danafu and, um, and CCA, Complete College America. 
Um, I'm excited to say that the very first webcast we ever did um, about a partnership was with College, Complete College America. Um, I happened to be in South Africa at the time, so I was doing it at midnight at night, um, as everyone else was on a normal time zone. Um, but it was really exciting because I think that was the first time that our two associations really had the opportunity to communicate to our members how important this partnership was. It was an opportunity for um, Dan and Fru to talk about the game changers and strategies that are so important to their work, but even more importantly, for us to make a commitment together that academic advising is key to those game changers and how we would partner on each of those as we move forward. So I think we've done a good job of that and, and moving that way. And so I'm turning it over to Danifer to talk a little bit about those game changers and how our partnership has benefited both of our groups in moving forward on those strategies that CCA is so well known for. So Danifu? Sure, thank you so very much. Um Charlie, and, and I really am just um, honored to be uh, joining my esteemed colleagues who you'll hear, who you'll hear from. Um, all of our work is very much uh, rooted in, in the, the goals around student success, and that truly has been the spirit of Complete College America. Since we uh, came into existence almost nine years ago uh, with a primary mission of ensuring that more students complete degrees of purpose and value. Um, you know, we recognize that part of that work is ensuring that we need equity of opportunity uh, at colleges and universities, and that most of our conversations for many, many years have been about access. And we wanted to help um, advance the discussion that access is critical, but completion is a complementary and very important component of that work. And that has been what we've been doing over the past few years, um, trying to make sure that we build an alliance of uh, states and consortia that are committed to that particular mission. Um, and we've also recognized that we need to partner with organizations that have been in this space for a very long time to ensure that their voices are loud and clear and resonant um, as we work on these strategies. And so for us, we've, um, we've really kind of distilled our work into a handful of strategies that many individuals are familiar with. Um, we refer to them as our game changers. Um, and, and we've made some slight modifications to the language, but you know, this guided pathways movement, we've really tried to kind of um, lay out what are some of the key components structurally that institutions can use to influence and shape um, the environment so that many more students can complete. And so those strategies are, are listed here, 15 to finish, ensuring on-time degree completion, um, momentum year, making sure academic maps are all designed uh, with uh, students in mind, uh, making sure students have different choices of, of mathematics and math pathways, and co-requisite support, which is um, a different model in dealing with students that have developmental needs that allow them to get through that developmental sequence in a shorter amount of time um, and moving forward to their academic map. And so, you know, with, as I look at every single one of these strategies, the one thing that I shared uh, as, a, uh, as a colleague, as a faculty member, and as an administrator for over 20 years at campuses, when I joined CCA, I said, we can't do this work without the academic advising community. And if we're gonna do this work well, we have to begin with those individuals that live in this space and that have been at the forefront of that work. And that's why this partnership with Nakata is so critical. Um, you know, we jumped in whole hog on a number of different initiatives and Charlie and the team and all the advisors across the country have been extremely supportive in a number of different initiatives. Um, a big one that we rolled out together was an on-time degree campaign, uh, which we refer to as 15 to finish and Nakata helped us develop a set of principles uh, around that that is consistent with Nakata's uh, mission and efforts. Uh, we're working with Nakata on a project now called Purpose First, and so helping students realize that before they jump onto a career, onto an academic map, we need to do some intentionality and some intentional work around ensuring they understand why they are moving into that particular academic focus area and how it aligns with their career. 
uh, NACAD has been very helpful and a strong voice in our technology seal of approval. So as institutions are choosing new technologies to advance their work, we wanna make sure that the components include things that advisors feel are very important. And so those were some of the early things that we jumped on and NACADA has been very engaged in. We've also now made sure that NACADA has a, a very strong presence in a number of our state academies and institutes. Our annual convening in Chicago, NACADA will be featured prominently. And we wanna make sure that we continue to learn from one another through a variety of national research. And so this work is absolutely important to us. We're very honored and pleased to be a partner with NACADA um, because this work in, you know, for our students, our communities, and our country um, is not going to get done without all of us working in tandem. And so, Charlie and the Nakata team, thank you very much for including us, and we look forward to our continued partnership. I think one of the things Ted said that I think is really important for all of these partnerships is that we're all learning from each other. And we're learning together and how to best support students and how to build those collaborative partnerships. So if a major theme for these partnerships could be named, I really think the learning is that theme um, because we're all bringing to the table different pieces of what we have and what we learn from each other make us better associations as well as make our um, students become more successful and making our associations better as we work with schools is all of our, if we looked at all of our mission statements, I'm sure that's in every one of ours. And so I think that learning piece is key. And Dan, if we thank you so much for, for highlighting that because that's an important piece for that. So Carrie, I think I'll turn it back over to you to, to move us to the next team. Yeah, um, and I will hand it right off to Jane Drake. Jane? Thanks, Carrie. So uh, what you see on the screen here is uh, a slide representing the Excellence in Academic Advising program. We've uh, joined hands with the Gardner Institute to create this Excellence in Academic Advising program, or EAA. And what it is, is a comprehensive strategic planning process that has the potential to change higher education as we currently know it and to affirm the role as well as the influence of uh, academic advising in higher education. This is a two-year program that um, officially begins this year with an inaugural cohort of 12 colleges and universities around the country that are being guided by specially appointed Nakata Fellows, and they're being guided through an evidence-based decision-making planning and implementation process to improve the institution's academic advising efforts. That's a mouthful. What this means is that the institutions selected to be part of our charter cohort, along with their Nakata fellows, will begin to take a very deep look at the EAA-9 conditions of excellence in academic advising that you see on the screen now. These nine standards for excellence are rooted in the understanding that advising is central to the teaching and learning mission of all institutions and holds a central place in promoting student learning success and uh, completion. So now this 12 uh, group of uh, this group of 12 institutions will take these nine conditions of excellence and they will refine, they'll validate and establish the aspirational standards for colleges and universities on how to improve and to evaluate academic advising itself. And this process uh, that we are engaging in draws on NACADA's academic advising audit experience through the AACSS or the Academic Advising Consultant and Speaker Service. We uh, have engaged 12 fellows who will help guide the institutions toward this uh, systematic and systemic change. So the important thing to remember, I think, for us as we continue our work is that this is an evidence-based and institutionally generated uh, process in which institutions make the recommendations for change within their, uh, within their institutions, as well as uh, for on our part to help 
provide support for the implementation of these nine conditions of excellence. And if I can quote from Charlie for just a second, uh, he, he reminds us that um, academic advising is a key component of student success, persistent and degree completion on many campuses. And so by examining advising through multiple lenses and implementing evidence-based recommendations, institutions can ensure that they are appropriately aligning their priorities for student success. That's what we're all about. Uh, and that is in a nutshell what the EAA does. So, but I'd like to stop the conversation here and turn it over to my colleague, Drew Koch, who is the President and Chief Operating Officer at the Gardner Institute. So Drew, take it away. Thanks, Jane. It's always a, a real pleasure to be able to do things like this with you and um, an, an honor to be able to partner with you on the EA initiative. I want to add in that um, um, really what we've done here is, is uh, I, I don't view this, I know Charlie doesn't view this, John doesn't view this as an external partnership. This is something different altogether. This kind of occupies that liminal space. It's just a partnership. Um, in that uh, it's not Nakata only, it's not Gardner Institute only, it's EAA, right? Excellence in Academic Advising. It does pull together, as Jane shared, Nakata's uh, deep, deep uh, and historic expertise and role as the global community for academic advising, but it does the same with the Gardner Institute's uh, going on 19 years of expertise with uh, evidence-based strategic planning for student success. Collectively, we've decided to apply our respective sets of skills and expertise and knowledge and networks to build something that really does help institutions create, as Jane said a couple of times, an evidence-based plan for student success and then implement. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means we're pulling together nine years of descriptive, an descriptive analytics, right? Yes, analytics is a part of this work. We're pulling together surveys of current faculty, staff, students who are academic advisors or, or being advised at the institution of their students uh, to give current student perspective. And then we're bringing together a big task force uh, and big is relative, right? Depending on the size of the institution to help them look at all that evidence, create a plan and implement it. And they look at all that evidence by using the nine conditions that Jane showed you a little earlier. Now, let me get back to where we are now. Jane mentioned 12 places. Um, kind of like one for every disciple if you're into, uh, you know, biblical comparisons, right? And I joke a little bit. It, it, uh, it is, though. They are the 12 inaugural. We're not ready to tell you who they are. They know who they are. Announcement is forthcoming. We do have plans for future cohorts. And note I emphasize the term future. Uh, Charlie, John, and I, Jane, and Susan Campbell, who's also a key partner in this, along with Vicki McGillan and Rob Rodier at the Gardner Institute. Um, we're, we're not ready to say, hey, it's in the fall of this year or the spring of that year. We're going to learn from this first cohort. We do have the possibility of rolling out a future cohort sooner as opposed to later as we're in conversation with at least one and potentially a few other uh, philanthropic organizations, one of which has invited us to submit a proposal. If that's successful, we may roll one out sooner as opposed to later. But stay tuned for formal announcements uh, about the progress both of announcing the first cohort uh, and then about potential cohorts in the future. So that's all I want to say now, other than I really want to thank the, uh, the, the board of directors, the council, uh, Charlie, and my Nakata colleagues for allowing us not just to be engaged in this webinar, but actually to be engaged in this liminal space, this thing we call excellence in academic advising. It, it really is a pleasure and honor to work with you. Great. Uh, Jane, uh, let me uh, have you unmute your mic because I think you're saying something really good. Oh. Really good. Uh, what I was saying was thanking Drew for uh, his insights and for updating us on uh, what the future may look like for, for our uh, EAA program. And uh, with that thanks in hand, I'd like to just ask Steve, Dan, Dan to know if he'd like to jump in and take over about the Reinvention Collaborative. Thanks, Jane. Appreciate it. Uh, Vanessa Harris and I are just delighted to be able to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the collaboration Nakata has with the Reinvention Collaborative, uh, which I serve as executive director. Uh, there are a lot of dimensions to it, but I'll first just tell you a little bit about the collaborative, since you may not know too much about that. And then we'll highlight some of the 
more important of the many uh, various kinds of collaborations that we've been working on with NACADA. And the Reinvention Collaborative is a national consortium of large research universities uh, that um, is based around uh, membership of a lot of different kinds of folks who work in, in colleges and universities, but it's based around those who have primary academic responsibility for undergraduate education. That's our focus. Undergraduates, innovation, their learning, their growth, and ultimately the completion, their success, earning that degree and having empowered lives as a result. And that membership, whether they have titles like vice provost or associate provost or dean of undergraduate studies, those kind of folks, when they come together in our meetings, we, we all talk about and, and appreciate and deeply understand the, ultra, the incredible importance of academic advising and guidance for uh, student learning and success. And so we've been very fortunate to partner with NACADA, as I said, in a number of different ways. Uh, Vanessa in a moment is gonna talk about our specialized network that focuses on that area of our concern. And what I would like to do uh, is uh, focus on our collaboration with the Administrators Institute, which as you know, uh, serves uh, the function of bringing folks together uh, who are in administrative roles uh, and have advising responsibility. Uh, and what we do, uh, particularly with respect to a relatively recent innovation on Nakata's part, to create a track B for folks who have university-wide responsibility of one sort or another, and it varies quite a lot from one institution to another. What we do is we have reinvention collaborative members uh, take part as faculty, along with Nakata faculty, uh, our colleagues, uh, to help um, nurture uh, learning, uh, learn from one another uh, uh, around issues that, excuse me, that affect the entire uh, campus community and that affect undergraduate success overall, track B. Uh, I've done it for the past three years. We look forward to uh, continuing that collaboration in Albuquerque for the 2019 Administrators Institute there. And we hope that uh, the folks who are participants in that important uh, gathering benefit from this collaboration and that they see uh, how uh, the work of advising administration connects directly to strategic goals that their institution has and their own uh, unit goals that uh, they've helped develop. Uh, and we certainly on our side of this collaboration uh, have learned a great deal from Charlie, his colleagues, all the Nakata faculty and the folks who have uh, come to these administrators institutes and shared of their experience and expertise. Uh, that makes uh, the jobs of our uh, members a lot easier. Uh, they're more informed, uh, they're more engaged, and we hope, we hope it's mutually beneficial. Uh, as I mentioned, Vanessa has uh, another set of experiences to share. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. And I am truly honored and excited to be working with you as part of this process for the Reinvention Collaborative. I wanted to just take a few minutes to really talk to you about the Academic Advising Guidance Network. It is one of the four or five networks that really really looking at the impact of research and student learning as it relates to student success. For the advising network, we are really looking at how does academic advising play in the role of student success? What is our role at the institution and the impact that we might have as it relates to research, as it relates to access, and also making sure that advising, and especially advising administrators, have a role at the table, that they are part of that conversation when change is being made as it relates to academic advising. So we are looking at it from a student-centered lens as institutional change with the impact of looking at curriculum, practice, and policies as those policy relates to academic advising and the roles that advising play within 
the realm of student persistence and student retention. We are also thinking of the sense of how diverse and dynamic our student population is, but also how diverse and dynamic advising is in this conversation. And how are we going to look at that focus and that lens of advising as a teaching mechanism and how are we helping our students to be more self-regulated learners, self-directed learners, and trying to shape their behaviors to facilitate student engagement, student exploration, and looking at student reflection as they start to look at their curriculum and co-curricular choices and how those have impact on their undergraduate career and experiences. We're also going to be looking at how we plan to achieve our vision. So our achieving our vision is to maintain collaboration across our institutions, collaboration with external partners, such as the ones that are here on this webinar, and looking at what are those stakeholders impact and change that could happen within the realm of academic advising as it relates to research and student learning. So we want to make sure that the academic advising community centered around student success, but also looking at it from institutional change, the changes that are occurring in your institution. How does that impact advising? which also in turn, how would that impact student success? Looking at the form of assessment and how does assessment play within the advising realm and how does assessment play with student learning as they project on to student success? And data, we are always talking about the importance of data and the impact of making informed decisions based on data. We wanna make sure that within the scope of the conversation of data, that there are questions that are related to academic advising what is that impact of academic advising as it relates to student success? Are we captured in that data process? And then research. We are very fortunate now that Nakata has the research um, institute and the research component um, within Nakata. Now, how is it that advising is gonna play in that scholarly inquiry? How is advising gonna play in the realm of understanding the importance of advising as it which turns to research, doing studies on the advising impact, and looking at that role within the four-year institution spectrum. So as a major part of our goal for this network, we want to facilitate the national conversation at research institutions. We want to make sure that, again, our colleagues are engaged in research, that we are expanding our network not just within the four co-chairs for this network, but throughout the network of our research institutions to make sure we're bringing in more of our advising administrators into this conversation. And then we wanna make sure that we share models of best practices as evidence-based institutional practices and organizational change that we can help broaden the lens of academic advising and the effect that we have on student success. Now with that, we're also going over to the next slide, looking at um, our upcoming biannual national conference. We have been very involved within this planning for this conference in the sense of submitting a proposal. And so November 8th to the 10th, this conference will be held in Arlington, Virginia. And one of the wonderful things about this is that the advising network has actually been accepted as one of the proposals we will be presenting there. And we're gonna look at the evolution, the transformation and future of academic advising in higher education. And within the scope of that presentation, we're gonna be looking at national surveys and reviewing them within a literature review to see where advising has fell within some of those questions within the survey. And then we will give you a future look of how we see advising and how it is going to evolve over the future as it relates to research, teaching, and ensuring that advising is really part of the conversation. So we look forward to seeing you at the conference. And now I will turn it back over to Charlie. If Charlie could find his unmute button, you would turn it back over to me, <laughs> Vanessa. Um, I just want to thank all of you for being with us and, and being a part of this. Um, 
I do want to, to, to say earlier that, that Denifu brought in the word learning, which was so important to this. And now Vanessa's brought in the second word that I think is so important to these partnerships we've discussed today, and that is the research. And that all, all of the partnerships that you've heard from today, as well as all the others Nakata is connected with, we're truly focusing on the future of our profession and student success in higher education must have a research base and it must clearly be grounded in research that shows what impacts student success. And one of the reasons all three of these partnerships are so important is because all three of these groups have a, a really strong and depth history of research in regard to what they've done individually and then Nakata's focus on research has been as long as our association has existed. And so those two pieces are key to that. Um, Kimmy, I think I'm supposed to turn it over to you now for the question and answer part, and we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks to all our panelists. So um, before we get started on the Q&A, just let me run through logistics again. Uh, down at the bottom of the page, you'll uh, see framing our screen a, a button for Q&A. This is how you can submit a question that you might have for the panel. Um, I also want to reiterate that there is the event webpage that has the link to the Google form on it. So if you uh, need a little time to process the things you've heard today but want to submit a question or a comment later on, please feel free to visit that page. Uh, we may not get to all the questions submitted today, but know that the, the board of directors and the executive office are very committed to making sure that, that all of them are responded to in some form or fashion. So in a couple weeks, there'll be a document up on the event page where we've gone through any of the submitted questions and, and provided a response or some information. Um, so with that, I am going to throw out a question that we've had come in. And uh, again, invite all of you to uh, submit if you, you wish. But here's our first question. And I, I guess I would direct this to any of the panelists, but maybe particularly to Danifu or Steve or Drew, as, as these partnerships and their respective projects have become more public, what has been the response out, uh, outside of the advising community? So from presidents or provosts or associate provosts, or other higher ed thought leaders to them? Sure, I'd be happy to, to jump in. Um, you know, I, as I shared in my comments, uh, one of the things, um, you know, I come from an, an, I have an institutional background and uh, for many years, CCA was strictly known as a policy and advocacy organization, but uh, across the country now, most folks understand that we are very much uh, working with institutions and systems on this work. And what I found when I was having conversations with state systems and leaders and even policy leaders is they had no um, clue that they needed to be engaging the academic advising community and how critical they were in making sure that any of these larger statewide and national initiatives actually came to fruition. And so the response has been, I would think, very, um, you know, very favorable. I mean, as a matter of fact, more institutions, more states, uh, more systems are now trying to figure out and ensure that they have representation from academic advising leaders uh, in their work. Um, there's less of a tendency now to kind of jump directly into policy as leverage and more to engage the academic advising communities um, at the institutional level. And so um, I think that our work is being very well received. I can jump in. Uh, among the senior academic leadership, I think academic advising is becoming uh, better understood and highly valued. And the reasons are pretty straightforward. Uh, everyone's concerned about undergraduate student success. That's true of private schools that are uh, largely uh, tuition dependent, self-supporting. That's increasingly true of public schools that are similarly so because of the decline in public support. So when the people start focusing on undergraduate education in that light, their minds tend to go to academic advising pretty quickly because they all realize, my gosh, 
Students are not going to be able to navigate these complex institutions. They're not going to be able to achieve what we want them to achieve without the support of the professional uh, dedicated um, primary role advisor, as well as faculty who are advising and others who have played very important roles, the coaches, the counselors, all the people who we might uh, think of very broadly as educators uh, involved in academic guidance. And in uh, my uh, past lives as a vice provost for undergraduate studies, associate provost at another institution, I've witnessed this firsthand over the past 10 to 15 years, a growing awareness, a growing appreciation uh, and understanding. That doesn't mean that there aren't issues, there aren't uh, biases that remain or misunderstandings or other concerns that we have. And hence, it's so important for us to partner with NACADA so as to make sure that when changes are being made, policies are being developed that affect the advising community, on our respective campuses that we're doing so with the voice and perspective of the advising community at the fore so that change isn't being done to people they are part of that change and they're making it better uh, as a result and we all benefit and that's my response to that important question there's a lot of positive we, we still have concerns we still have to be vigilant Steve, thanks. This is uh, Drew Koch sharing, and I want to pick up on, on two elements that uh, Don Food and uh, you had shared. Um, and really, at some level, maybe reframe or rephrase the question a little bit. I, I don't anymore view uh, presidents or provosts or associate provosts particularly as, quote unquote, outside of advising. As a matter of fact, I think increasingly, as Steve, you've alluded to this, they, they recognize they have a role or at least have shared interest in a broader advising ecosystem. And I, I think that's been abundantly clear and it's manifested itself in the conversations that, that Charlie and Jane and Susan Campbell and John and I have had with all the institutions that applied to be charter members in the EAA cohort. And I'll focus specifically on that, that partnership to answer this question. Um, so I, I do think as part of that ecosystem, there has been very good response to the work that we're doing and very strong interest to the point where we even said we have to talk with chief academic officers at all institutions. In a couple of cases, they said, no, you also have to talk with our president, right? So, um, you know, from our experience, there's been strong senior administrator interest and awareness of where they fit in this ecosystem. I think on the other part, the, the broader higher ed thought leader, more likely the broader higher ed uh, community, there's also been strong interest in excellence in academic advising. We've had uh, Inside Higher Ed do a short little story on it. The Chronicle did a broader story on advising in which EAA was mentioned. And we have several um, foundation major national philanthropic organizations thinking about being aware of EAA and one that's even invited us to submit a, a requested proposal. So the point that I get at is that at least from the excellence in academic advising perspective, uh, this is on organizations and people's and leaders radar very much so. Uh, I'm looking forward to, I know uh, my Nakata colleagues, my Gardner Institute colleagues and I collectively and respectively are looking forward to the evidence we'll be collecting. You know, when you do an analytics-based process, you're going to collect a lot of data. So we'll also keep this on uh, people's forefront and, uh, and shape practice and reflect on it by being able to mine into that. I think the work that, uh, that uh, Wendy Troxel will be able to do with colleagues out of Nevada, uh, the Nevada, Nakata Research Center, which isn't in Nevada, um, will uh, we'll also aid to this. So short version, it's EAA is definitely on people's radars. Uh, where it's not on their radars, it will be based on the evidence we collect and the reporting that we collectively and respectively do in this work. I'm, I'm quite excited and positive about all of it. Let me piggyback real yeah, quick. Like oh, go ahead, Charlie. Okay, I, I, would, I would just like to add to that, Carrie, that one of the beauties, I think, of this partnership is um, if, if if I'm nothing, I'm realistic and um, realize that Nakata has 40 something years of history behind us in reaching to advisors, advising directors, faculty advisors. But to be quite honest, we've not always reached the presidents and the provosts and the associate provosts. And I think it's through the partnerships of folks like the Reinvention Collaborative 
with CCA, with the Gardner Institute, with APLU, that we're able to actually get into those um, crystal towers, if you want to call them that, um, on campuses. Everybody has their own title for what those existing buildings may be. Um, but for the first time to actually have folks such as the Garden Institute and Reinvention Collaborative say to President, now are you familiar with the Nakata? Are you familiar with the work they've done? Here's the Nakata Journal. Here's whereas we might not have been able to make that inroad. And so for us as an association, these partnerships have been just essential in us reaching that higher level of administrators that we've not always been able to before. And we're so very, very thankful um, for these partnerships. And I want to personally thank the board of directors for making this such an important strategic goal um, and focusing on this um, for at least the past six years um, in, in focusing on it. So um, that's, those are my comments on that, Carrie. Thanks, Charlie. Um, we had a great question come in. Um, what will the opportunities be for end user members of NACADA to get involved both as volunteers or perhaps even, uh, you know, permanent positions or things like that, anything with these developing initiatives? Where, where do you see uh, maybe some entry points for NACADA members, not just as beneficiaries, but maybe as, as contributors? I'll jump in first and then anybody else can join in. Um, Danifer has already done a wonderful job of reaching out to us over the past four years, at least that I can remember Danifer, of saying to Nakata, we would like to have a representative, representatives from Nakata at these here, these different meetings or these different events. And so we've had a numerous number of members who have been become actively involved with their game changing, their strategic initiatives because of that reaching out to that within that. Um, I think the same goes with the Reinvention Collaborative, uh, with the work of, of hearing about them with the track B part of the Administrators Institute. Um, we've had a couple um, of folks who, because they were involved in those track Bs, to be quite honest, um, were able to get some positions of higher authority on their campuses because they were able to talk about that experience of what that having that higher aspect become. And then very selfishly, um, Nakata is going to continue to need um, consultants that will be able to fill the Nakata fellow positions as we expand future roles um, and future cohorts of the EAA. And so I encourage everyone to go to the Nakata Academic Advising um, Consultants and Speaker Service page that Vanessa spoke of earlier. And it tells you exactly there how to apply to become a Nakata Consultant. And that's a great way to get involved within that. Um, and um, I just think that those are great opportunities. As far as full-time jobs, Kiwi, um, you know, sooner or later, I got to die and retire, so somebody needs to be ready there. So, um, but uh, more than that, um, so, um, but, but very seriously, we're we're continuing to 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 add positions and add work. So, I don't see anything but growth because of these partnerships, as well as the the, the other partners we have, which we didn't have time to, to bring into this particular webcast. And maybe we do a future webcast with other partners as well to, to bring those in. Charlie. Sorry, go, go ahead, Drew, sorry. Hey, thanks, Carrie, I didn't mean to talk over you. Although it was nice how we synchronized our Charlies. Yeah. yeah it was stereo. Um, I just want to add, we've, um, uh, Charlie and Nakata have been actively engaged and have done pre-conference workshops and presentations at the annual Gateway Course Experience Conference, and we'll continue to do that and actually have communities of practice meetings on that around the EA project. Uh, the same is said at the, uh, uh, at the Nakata annual meeting. While those communities of practice are just for the EA community now, some of the pre-conference workshops, some of the other things that we'll be doing, they're open to uh, broader participants and broader audiences. So that there's ways right now to learn. As EA grows and expands, I can only imagine that, uh, that there will be 
uh, numerous ways to get involved. I mentioned some of the evidence that we have in Wendy's work in the research center. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, this will evolve and grow in time. Right now we're in the nascent stages with EAA. So stay tuned and we'll be able to share more. And, and if I can just jump in very quickly, you know, one of the things that I think um, was important about that question is we have to amplify the work that's taking place um, on the campuses and in the lives of academic advisors. And so uh, six months ago, Complete College America uh, launched a new web portal and it's uh, completecollege.org. But anybody can set up a profile and highlight the work that they're doing around our various strategies. And we actually use that web profile to start identifying individuals who are exemplars, who we can use as consultants and content experts. And I think that is an excellent way to amplify your work on a campus on a national level. Excellent. I just would like to add one more thing, and that is that I've always said to members, and I continue to say, the more you can get your name in front of your presidents and provosts and associate provosts in a good way, the better that is for you. And so what better way than to be able to share with your provost material about game changers that are coming out of CCA and how you're involved with that or your participation at the reinvention collaborative network and that piece of that or taking the EAA application to your provost and say, we really need to be a part of this process um, as they move forward with new aspects of that. Um, because part of this is we have to, all of us are responsible for our own growth. And so how do we use what we learn through these partnerships to make sure our campuses know, you know, the other people in the country who are turning to me for questions about what's great on campus and we're not being, you're not always turning to me. So it's a great way to make sure that your, your own presence and provost know that, hey, the other campuses who are saying, I want to hear from Carrie Kincannon. Um, and Carrie, there's lots of places who tell me that on a daily basis, so don't think I'm just saying that. Uh, we're gonna get your application as a consultant yet. Um, but um, many times your own campuses don't recognize that. You know, the old saying, the experts, the person with the better briefcase and the fancier PowerPoint, um, you all have the same knowledge how do you get that to the folks above you? And these partnerships are great ways to share that information. Totally, awesome. got, put, totally got put on the spot there uh, in a very public forum. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, go ahead. Yes, I wanted to also say that as part of the Advising and Academic Guidance Network, we are currently in discussions now of what would be the best mechanism to incorporate more of the general um, Nakata membership into this relationship. So we're trying to figure out what are some best ways that we can get information from the advising community to upload some of their evidentiary best practices on some of the things on their campuses and how they are involved in research activities and collaborations across their institutions. So look for that information to come soon. And then one more thing, Carrie, and that is all three of these leaders of these national associations and nonprofits are people who will be more than happy to talk to any frontline advisor or any faculty advisor or any grad student who has an interest in advising and moving forward. So, you know, our contact information's out there. So you now know us, you've seen us, like Steve and say, what are the ideas here? Right, Danifu, right, Drew. Um, we're all here to support you. We, we got where we are because somebody supported us. You know, I'm, at, I'm where I am because Jane Drake took me under her wing many years ago and, and told me what I needed to be doing. And so we're all here to support you. So I encourage you all, and Drew's sitting there right now thinking, okay, I've got 95 million more emails coming in my box. Um, but seriously, we all believe in the, the future of the association, of our associations, but the future of higher ed. And we're here to help anyone in moving forward. So don't hesitate to email us and, and let us know how we can help you. You know, Charlie, the one thing I would add is even if there are 95 million more emails, the type of the ones that you're talking about, I like it. 
So, yeah, please it's do. The one, it's the ones for me you have trouble with, Trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have my cell phone. You just, you just find me. Yeah. We, we have a, a few remaining, but I did want to throw out another question there. Um, and Drew brought this up. Vanessa brought it up as well. The, the Nakata Center for Research strikes me as a, as, as you know, a, a, a key potential key player in all of these relationships. And so I, I didn't want to give Jane and, and Danifu and, and, and Charlie and anyone else who hasn't had a chance to comment specifically on the Center for Research and the role that it might play in, in the relationship, in the partnership. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? I have one quick, and then I'm going to let those two speak, and that is if you've not gone to the website for the center, do so. We're so very exciting. Um, we're setting up a series of what we're calling writing groups that are supporting new writers in the field of advising. Um, we have 155 people registered for 27 groups this fall alone. Um, that shows there's an interest out there for folks to do an advising. So it's a great thing to do. Go to that website, register to, to get into a writing group and, and talk with other people. So um, I'm very, very excited about those writing groups um, and, and where that's moving. I'm sorry, Jane. And, no, yeah. that's all right. Uh, I was just going to say, apropos of uh, the question regarding research and the research center and the EAA program, uh, they're they're tied, joined at the hip. Wendy Troxel, who heads up the research center, is working closely with the folks at the Gardner Institute on establishing the platform, the inventory, the survey, all of the uh, IT bells and whistles behind the scenes, the ropes, the pulleys. Uh, in getting the EAA uh, program up and running. Uh, it's going to be uh, heavily IT involved uh, data in data gathering, uh, evidence gathering, in the, especially in the early stages of uh, institutional uh, interrogation of those nine conditions of excellence. And there's no way that uh, we would be able to uh, engage with Gartner or engage this process more broadly if it weren't for the good work that Wendy is uh, engaged with uh, Rob Brodier and uh, th that team at Gardner. So the, the, the interlacing is, is there. Yeah, Jan, and I'll, I'll just add a little bit onto it. We yeah. will be able to have, um, it'll be anonymized, but it'll be student level data. And student level data right now, the, the, the Institute has over 2 million unique uh, instances of student level data complete academic history in EAA that will add up pretty quickly and we will be able to take some of the elements that we talk about evidence-based theory and evidence-based practice and really link it with student evidence and link it with institution policies and procedures and practices in a way that uh, neither the Gardner Institute and Nakata have been able to do before quite frankly the Gardner Institute has had the technical know-how particularly over the past five years six years but um, we've never gone into the advising realm. And uh, Nakata partnering with us allows us to bring, uh, you know, some of that technical and analytical expertise as well as the, the uh, uh, critical, uh, you know, institutional support that, that goes along with uh, evidence-based redesign and link that with Nakata's expertise. I think what Wendy will have is a treasure trove. And I am not Wendy. And if I was trying to be, I wouldn't play her well on television, right? But what I will tell you is that um, there's room for grad students, PhD dissertations, uh, postdoc studies in our soon to be vast data sets, nine years of student level information from every EAA institution. We'll have over a century of student level data from just the first cohort. So Wendy, um, you may be the one getting 95 million emails, not me. But bottom line, there, there, there are research opportunities in all of this. Another quick point, Kerry, is I think but with all three of these associations is all three are so closely connected to faculty. And one of the things that has been so exciting is one of the first research projects that started to be discussed and was presented about in Dublin at our international conference and will be more so in Phoenix is a study of how how much academic advising is being written about in peer-reviewed journals 
and that the that the most advising that's being written about are not in student success or Nakata journals, they're in content journals, which mean faculty are really beginning to write about advising. And so as we think about the work with the Reinvention Collaborative, with CCA, with, with the, the Gardner Institute, um, getting faculty involved with doing that level of research, I think the research center is gonna be key in. And so that, that research um, study is really exciting to see that data and where all the research is being written about. Uh, folks, uh, this conversation has been amazing and I know we could go on for much longer, but we are at the top of the hour, so we do need to end. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that Wendy has, has chimed in a couple times, so she's hearing you, Drew, uh, and, and noted that 140 different academic journals uh, are part of that uh, inventory that, that Charlie has talked about. Uh, she also wanted to make sure that we noted that the writing groups sign up for fall are closed, is closed as of now, uh, but groups for spring will open up on October 15th. So if that's of interest to you, make sure that you go visit the site as Charlie recommended and for information about that. Uh, so with that, I, I'm gonna help us wrap up. Thank you so much to all our folks who, who came to join us today, both as panelists and as participants. We really appreciate your time and your investment in this this topic and, and Nakata and academic advising on the whole. Uh, just another shout out to the event webpage. Uh, a recording of this event will be posted there uh, very soon. And then we'll also have follow up to any questions or ideas that we weren't able to get to today. Uh, so with that, thank you panelists, thank you participants, and, and everybody have a great day. <laughs>